that you bless them for being here. Let the next one hour or so be a blessing to them and be a blessing to me and be a blessing to all of us. Teach me, teach them, teach all of us and inspire our spirits together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Glory be to Jesus. So, yeah, <laughs> we bless God, we bless God, we bless God. We, we, we want to talk about hell, hell, hell. Hell has become such a common thing. We, we have spoken about hell so many times to the extent that it has even found its way into our vocabulary so that we, we are speaking and we say things like, hell no, and uh, uh, what the hell is wrong with you? You know, <laughs> it's as if we are, we are playing with a word, but you see, <laughs> hell is not a joke. It is not a joke. <laughs> it, it is not something that somebody has imagined. It isn't something that religion has uh, created to scare people and to make them live moral lives. It is a real place and it exists. It is there. Life and colored is a place. Just like the Garden of Eden has been hidden from mankind since the fall of man. Just like heaven, the third heaven, is hidden from mankind. And no scientist, no astrologist can discover where heaven actually is. Though we know it's beyond the stars. And you know it's even impossible to get to the stars. I mean, we are talking of light years even from, from, from the surface of the earth, <laughs> to get to the stars. It's, it's no joke at all. And we know it's somewhere up there. We just don't know the location. But in the same thing, we know there is hell. How do we know? Because the Bible tells us so. That indeed, there is hell. <laughs> Glory be to you, Jesus. Now, as we go on, I would want to explain certain things because we hear things like uh, um, Sheol. We hear things like Lake of Fire. We hear things like um, Hades. We hear things like um, Gehenna, the Gehenna. That we hear, we hear all sorts of things, you know, a fire of, of a fire flowing with brimstone, a place of darkness, a place where people go and they do not return anymore. We, we hear all these things and people have various views about them. You know, some saying that hell and, and Hades are the same and or hell and then Sheol are the same and things like that. But we would want to break things down. <laughs> okay, so those of you in Ghana, um, our sister Na has just written something. I'll say, <laughs> Bunsam Jim. So, uh, Bunsam Jim, uh, those who do not know what it is, uh, that is that is what we call the lake of fire, okay? The fire of Satan, Bunsam Jim. Yeah. Yeah, so Bonsam Jim, and we all know what Bonsam Jim is. But Bonsam Jim is not a joke. It's not a joke. You see, initially, it wasn't created for man. God did not plan for Adam. I mean, he, he, he did not want Adam or any of his descendants to end up in hell. But he created it. Mr. Anum, uh, welcome, Mr. Anum, uh, welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. But it is there and it is real. Now, the word hell in itself, hell, the English word hell is not mentioned in the Old Testament. It's not there. So even the fathers of faith were not familiar with the word hell. In fact, throughout the whole of the, <laughs> the Old Testament, 
the place they were familiar with is called Sheol. Sheol, not hell. Sheol. Tosili, Tosili, welcome. It's called Sheol, not hell. So, all of them, the fathers of old, and all those big guys we see in the Bible from Jacob to Abraham to all those guys, it was Sheol they knew, and not hell. We got to see what hell was when Jesus came down to actually give us details. So, let's start from Sheol, because I've mentioned hell, I've mentioned Sheol, I've mentioned Hades. I've mentioned the lake of fire. And then uh, I've mentioned uh, Gehenna. Okay, I've mentioned Gehenna. So I'll begin with Sheol. In fact, today I do not intend to go beyond one hour or something because I would want to go to part two next week, Sunday evening, God willing. So today will be part one. Okay, so though we will do a lot of things, uh, we, we will uh, leave the rest for next week. So we are on Sheol. So what is Sheol? Now, Sheol refers to the underworld. That was the knowledge and tradition of the Jews, the Babylonians, the Greeks. All the uh, cultures and traditions and societies of old considered a place called Sheol. Some some other cultures will call it uh, Van Hela and, and other names. People have all sorts of names. In fact, here in Ghana, people are confused as to how to situate the Akan word that we usually use, Asamando. Whether Asamando is paradise Asamando is hell. Asamando is whatever. So today you are getting the actual meaning and translation of what Asamando is. Those of you in Ghana, those who speak Chi, Asamando is Sheol, not hell, not paradise, Sheol. Now, all these people of old, including the Jews, um, though people consider that as just a metaphor, you know, something is an imaginary thing just made up. And some theologians still argue about what it actually is. But you see, limiting ourselves to the tradition of the Jews, the Jews believed in reincarnation. The Jews believed in ghosts, okay? The Jews believed in Sheol. It doesn't mean that Jesus believed in them. But because they believed in them, Jesus used them as examples and as parables to explain things to them. It's just like Jesus was born in Ghana and we believe so much in something, you know, that anytime somebody dies, the person was killed by someone. You know, God would definitely use that as an example in a scenario, in a preaching or something, just to demonstrate something to, to us. So, because the people at the time knew and believed so strongly that there was a place called Sheol, Jesus used that Sheol. It doesn't mean Jesus believed in Sheol, but he used what the people believed to demonstrate a parable to them. And that is how come... You can turn your Bibles with me right now to Luke chapter 16, verse 22 to 26. Luke chapter 16, verse 22 to 26. Let me try and get that uh, right now. Luke chapter 16, verse 22 through to the verse number 26. Okay, so I'm reading it right now. I want to use uh, the NIV. The time came, in fact, let me start from verse 19. Now, this is Jesus speaking, giving them a parable. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived a luxury every day. 
At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, now I am mentioning Hades for the first time in my reading, though I've mentioned it earlier. Verse 23. In Hades, where he was in torment, okay, so Jesus is now acknowledging that there is a place of torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Adianadani, as I said. Okay, so verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm. A great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from your side to our side. He said, verse 27, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers, let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Now I'm going on to verse 31. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Hmm. What a story. What a parable. Oh, 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 oh. Woman of God, woman of God. Wow. Prophet Theresa is here with us. Mama General. Uh, bless you for joining in. Wow. Bless God. Bless you for joining in. Bless you for joining in. Bless you for joining in. <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, Prophetess Princess, Akwabo, Akwaba. So, you see, I, I was in a vehicle. Um, I, 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 I was in a trotro. Uh, th this is like 10 years ago. I was in a trotro at, um, in Accra, Kwame Nkrumah Circle. And uh, something happened. Um, please, if you join, just say a hi to me, okay? Uh, j just lift up your hand. Let me let me acknowledge you, okay? Uh, I'm seeing some people. I don't know them by name, but I know they've joined in. Yeah. So I was in Nkrumah Circle, and someone was sharing some flyers. So <laughs> he just came to stand uh, by by my window and and tossed in the flyer. I looked on the flyer, and this is what I saw. Wow, lawyer, lawyer Dixon, bless you for joining. Wow, wow, wow. Now, I looked on the flyer, and this was the inscription on the flyer. God loves you so much. How can a God who loves you so much take you to hell? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
L let me take that again. God loves you so much. How can a God who loves you so much take you to hell? Now, this is not a doctrine to joke with. Any doctrine that has the capability of landing you in hell is from the pit of hell. Let me say that again. Any doctrine that has the potential of interrupting and <laughs> confusing your walk from entering heaven is a doctrine cooked from the pits of hell. Now, those who have counted claim that I haven't counted myself. I mean, the, the counting I have done in the New Testament, I have seen the name hell, hell, mentioned about 34 times in the New Testament. I haven't counted at all. What I have counted is 34. But those who say they have counted claim that in the New Testament alone, there are about 162 references to either hell, Hades, or lake of fire. I haven't counted. But what I have personally counted, I have counted about 34 references to hell. And many of these references are not coming from Paul. They are not coming from any of the epistles. They are not coming from Acts or anywhere. They are coming from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus himself mentioned hell many times. And look at what we have read from Luke chapter 16. Jesus is actually preaching and teaching them with a parable using what they are used to. They are used to uh, Sheol. And he's using Sheol. Just that in some versions, like this recent NIV, Sheol has been changed to, to, to uh, Hades. Okay? But Jesus uses Sheol to demonstrate to them. And look at what Jesus tells them about, I mean, a deep pictorial evidence, a wide imagery of what is happening beyond earth when we die, what happens after we die. And it is scary. It is scary. It's not a joke. It is scary. This is not some Pauline theology. This is not any form of Peterian theology. This is Christology. This is from the mouth of God himself, the mouth of the master himself. He says there is hell and it is real. So how do you, in any form of imagination, even in your widest imagination, claim or say or even suggest that hell does not exist? Like, like, <laughs> like how? Sebi, 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 sebi. Bibi aboko. How? How? How can any, any, any group of people actually say this and go around preaching them? When the master said the place exists. Not once, not twice, not three times. We are not talking of a doctrine like smoking. Where you could say, okay, there's no part of the scripture that says smoking is good or bad. Well, destroying the temple is relative. If you smoke, you destroy the temple. If I also take too much of Coca-Cola, I'm destroying the temple. If I take too much of sugar, I'm destroying the temple. So whether I smoke or I take a petition or, or I take cocaine, well, it's all the same because we are all destroying the body. Such things are debatable. But when it comes to the matter of hell, it is there word for word. Papa le den cheke ni eje me bi adamini gba ona. The thing is there. It is there. It is real. Jesus said the place exists. And he demonstrated it in many places. And I have read just one for you with the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And because the Jews believed that Sheol 
was a place where people go after they die. And between Sheol, you could stretch your, your, your head far away and see another place of joy. You could see heaven from far away from hell. That is what the Jews believed. That is why Jesus demonstrated it that way to them. It doesn't mean that um, heaven and hell are in the same place. They are in the same area. You can just be in hell and you lift up your head and you can see heaven, you know. <laughs> when we when we continue with this and we speak about the location of heaven and the location of hell, you get to see the locations. Okay, so you get to realize they are far apart. But Jesus only used this because he knew that is what the Jews believed. So he wanted to use the scenario they were used to to make a parable for them so they could understand what happens in Sheol. And then in in, in heaven, what happens after we die? What happens in the afterlife? Okay, so let me say this again. Sheol is basically the afterlife. The afterlife. And as I've said earlier, it is what we in Ghana call Asamando. Okay, Asamando. It is believed by the Jews of old and many other cultures that when we die, we go to Sheol. So Sheol is where every human being goes, where we all go to wait for our judgment. And after the judgment, right there in Sheol, those who are bad people are tortured in fire. So you remember in Luke chapter 16, Jesus mentioned uh, Sheol, he mentioned uh, Hades and then the fire, and the rich man was suffering in the fire. Okay, so they believed that Sheol contained some fire as well. It contained some fire as well. But when we step into the next dimension where we get to see that actually hell is different from Sheol, you get to appreciate that Jesus was just trying to help their understanding. Okay, so there is something we should note that the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament fathers of faith, held something so much dear to their hearts. It was how to ensure that they would not perish in Sheol. So they believed in Sheol. The problem now was, okay, how do I not perish in Sheol? So I go to Sheol, but I wouldn't perish. I'll go to Sheol, but I'll just go and wait and rest until Judgment Day. So once again, let me stress this. Sheol is a place where they believed every human being goes, whether you are good or you are bad. Only that when you are good and you go to Sheol, you are not tortured in the fire. But when you are bad, you are wicked, you go to Sheol, you'll be tortured in the fire. That is all. So, now let's look at the difference between hell and Hades. Hell and Hades. What is hell? What is Hades? Uh, uh, Sister Joyce Ling, uh, Atiase Wobel, wow. Uh, bless you for joining us. Um, Prof, Prof Kofiedu, I see you. Bless you for joining in. Uh, my brother is here as well. Uh, Nick, I see you. I see you, Charlie. Captain Yan. Captain Yan, Charlie. <laughs> Bless you. I see you too. So what's, uh, what's the difference between hell and Hades? Now, you, you would see many things flying around, you know, about hell, about Hades. Uh, hell is some way. Hell, Hades is some way. Look, don't be confused. Don't be confused. Hell and Hades are the same. Hades is Greek. Hell is English. That's all. That is all. It's as simple as that. Hell is English language. Hades is Greek. Hades was named after one of the high-ranking demonic angels who were sacked from heaven. So watch this, watch this. 
<laughs> Hades is not just a name of a place. Hades is also a name of a person. It's a name of an angel who is a high-ranking angel like Lucifer. Let me say that again. It's not just Hades. There is also... <laughs> oh, my Lord. There is also another... Uh, uh, another angel, you know, who fell. Another angel who fell. Who is called in English, death. In Greek, we call him uh, Thanatos. Okay? So, there is Thanatos and there is Hades. They are fallen angels who were sent down to hell. And God held Hades down there in hell. So, he is there. But death was given the power to roam about in the world. So, <laughs> God can decide to call you to himself by sending his angel to come for you. That is, if you are under the protection of the Lord. So, we believers in the Lord, we don't die, we sleep. We don't die. The angel just comes to carry us, you know, our spirits to heaven. Uh, technically, it's not heaven, and we'll get there very soon up to the Lord, and then our souls goes to a resting place, okay? Please, as I go on, if there's any question, uh, kindly just post it on the, on the platform, and I will I will try my, my possible best to, to answer you. And so, this is it. Um, uh, where was I? Where was I? Where was I? I'm a bit lost. Uh, where was I? Yeah, I, I was giving the difference between hell and Hades. And I was on the personality of Hades and death. And I'm saying that, though in English we call it death, in Akan, Owo, Aku, Bele, all the names of death you know. Death is not just a force. Death is actually a falling angel. <laughs> and when we get to Revelation, you get to realize that because Thanatos, the angel, the person that we call death, Thanatos, is a person. Death is a person. And Hades is also a person. Both of them are going to be cast into the lake of fire. We may treat that next week or today before I close. We'll just get to the revelation and just read and then we are on our way. Okay. So get this in mind one more time. Hell or Hades, I've told you hell and Hades are the same. Hell is English, Hades is Greek. So hell and Hades are the same. And it is not just a place, it's a person. Okay. So you see, because God created the place and sent the chief demonic angel to man the place, the name of the angel was also given to the place. So just like it is done in the days of old, my name is uh, opening Kujo uh, Aqua. Uh, so I go to form a village in 1700 and I decide to name the village Kujo Aqua. Okay, uh, you know that's what happens, especially in many parts of Africa. I mean, the first person to settle at the place names the place. Okay, Cain and Abel. When Cain, any time Cain went to a place, he named the place. So, he who gets to the land first, names the place. So, Hades, the name of Hades was used to name that whole place. That whole place of torture, that whole place that the Old Testament people called Sheol. They imagined as Sheol. Okay, so his name was given to the place. So the next time you mention death or the next time you mention uh, uh, Hades, you should know that you are not only referring to a place, you are also referring to a person. Okay. So one more time, 
just as I have told you earlier, that hell is English and Hades is Greek. It's just like uh, Messiah and then um, Christ. Okay, Messiah means the anointed one. Christ means the anointed one. Messiah is Hebrew. Okay, Christ is Greek. So whether you say Messiah or Christ, you are saying the same thing. The anointed one. It's not a name. It's a title. Okay, so Jesus' technical name should have been, is actually, you know, Yeshua Yusuf. Okay, Jesus Joseph. Okay, that is his name. His name is not Messiah. His name is not Christ. That is only a title. So the name is Jesus the Christ. Jesus the anointed one. Okay, so Jesus the Christ. Then I'm speaking English and Greek. Jesus the uh, the Messiah. Then I'm speaking English and Hebrew. That's all. So that is the only thing between hell and Hades. So don't confuse it at all. It's the same thing. So now what is the difference between Sheol and hell? You have differentiated hell and Hades. Now, what's the difference between Sheol and hell? Okay. Sheol, as I've said, the men of old saw Sheol as a place that all men go after death, a resting place, while they are with judgment. Okay. Now, when Jesus came to uncover and gave us many scenarios and 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 many parables and gave us many hints about a place called hell we began to see that oh okay so the men of old old had an idea of a place like that they were just not too sure though they were sure that sheol is a place but jesus came to give us a better explanation so sheol is a samando all right but hell is the place where people who are either outside Christ, they have not accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, or they have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, but they fell out with the Lord along the line. Or people who came to Christ and yet they were pretending and they became disobedient. So they were Christians, all right, but they were uh, homosexuals, they were fornicators, they were robbers, they were liars. I mean, the seven things that the Lord hates. Proverbs chapter 6. Lying is number two. <laughs> you know, sometimes we, we, we rate homosexuality over lying. Uh, well, according to God's list of the things he hates, Homosexuality is not even in the first five. In fact, homosexuality is not in the first seven. Number two is lying. Can you imagine? Proverbs chapter six, lying. <laughs> well, th th that is a matter for another day. And so, hell, you see, the difference between hell and Sheol is that the people of old thought that Sheol is for everybody whether you are good or bad, except that the good people are not tormented, the bad people are tormented. But hell is a place for only bad people. And by bad people, I mean people who have rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior. And bear in mind, the greatest sin in the world, and let nobody tell you that all sin are equal. No, that is not what the Bible teaches. Every sin is sin, but not all sin not all sins are equal, okay? <laughs> we have grades of sin. That is why there are certain sins, God says, as for these ones, I hate them, okay? So we have things God hates. Yes, he doesn't like every sin, but there are things that he hates. There are things that are abominations to him, like incest, like homosexuality. Those are abominations. So we have sins, we have transgressions, we have iniquities. You know, they, they are in different, different forms, okay? Yeah. So that is the place where hell is for. So Sheol does not factor in where good people go. Sheol just plasters everybody into one place after you die. However, Jesus tells us that when bad people, and I've defined what I mean by bad, okay? I've defined what I mean by bad. People outside the saving of Christ, people who have rejected Christ, people who are Christians but are disobedient. 
they are in Christ all right, but they are behaving, they are still continuing in sin. They go to hell. But the people who are in Christ, the children of the Lord, when they die, they don't go to hell. And they don't go to Sheol. So the Old Testament people were not accurate. They just suspected. Okay? They just suspected. They just believed and suspected, you know, that indeed we all go to Sheol. But according to Christology, the teachings of Christ, the people of old, they got it wrong. We don't go to Sheol. Those who are in Christ... They go to somewhere else. The bad people go to hell. The people who are in Christ, they don't go to heaven. They go to a place called paradise. Not heaven. The, the, but you see, when you say heaven to you are not entirely wrong. Okay, when you say people who die, they go to heaven. You are not you are not entirely wrong. Because there is the heavenly region, okay? There is the first heaven, there is the second heaven, there is the third heaven. The third heaven has regions. It, it has, it's like, assume the third heaven is Ghana or the USA. So in the third heaven, there's a place called New York, there's a place called California, there's a place called Mississippi, you know, uh, you know, Philadelphia and all that. That is how the third heaven is. So there's a certain portion of the third heaven that is called paradise. And there's a certain portion of the third heaven that is called the throne room of God. There's a place in the third heaven where actually the 24 elders are. There's a place in the third heaven where babies are stored. As we speak right now, they are babies. The people are there. When, when, when a man and wife have intercourse, then a baby is dispatched. <laughs> Go and enter into the womb of Mr. and Mrs. Grant. Go and enter into the womb. Because we existed before time. We all existed before time. We have already existed in a special place that only the Lord knows. So we only take on flesh when the time is due and when the protocols of the earth realm are satisfied, which is that every human being must come into the world through the womb of a woman. Okay, so let's go back again to the third heaven. It's in dimensions. How do we know that those who have died are not in the third heaven? You see, usually when we refer to the third heaven, we are not talking about the whole of the heavenly region. We are talking of God's presence where you can see the throne. This is the father. This is the sun seated at the right hand. This is the Holy Spirit hovering over the place. These are angels worshiping and singing day and night. That particular place, Jesus referred to that place in John chapter 3 verse 13. That particular place is what many people refer to as heaven. Okay, so when we all say heaven, we usually mean God's presence. I mean, where God's office is. His office. And remember... Heaven is not God's sleeping place. God is everywhere. He's on earth. He's in heaven. He's everywhere. But God is bigger than the earth. He's bigger than the heavens. The heavens cannot contain him. He's too big. God is too big. He is bigger than the third heaven. He is bigger than the first and second heavens. He is bigger than the entire universe. He is bigger than eternity. God is bigger than everything. Even the heavens cannot contain him. And so, if he comes to sit in his office in heaven, and where he is, it's not as if he gets up and goes somewhere and comes back because he's everywhere. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. But when we are speaking in terms of technicalities and how his dimensions work as Father, as Son, as Holy Spirit, and how they work differently, and yet they are three in one, exhibiting the power of the Trinity, we get to see that when he sits on his throne, as father, at his right side is the son. Okay? Exactly. Unapproachable light. <laughs> Unapproachable light. You know, so when he sits on his throne, 
Bible says that the earth is his footstool. The heavens cannot contain him. The earth cannot contain him. But he tries. He manages. He manages to squeeze himself <laughs> to put his feet on the earth. You know, and we are not talking about God being big literally, as in his obolo. We are trying to speak of his greatness. No space can contain him, not even the heavens. Nowhere can contain him. So up there, there are dimensions. In the same way, down there in the place where we thought was Sheol, there are dimensions. There are various dimensions. Okay. So how do we know again? That those who die in Christ, because in the Old Testament we are told that Elijah ascended to the heavens. But remember, there are three heavens. The first heaven is the heaven you see when you lift up your head. The clouds, the sky, that is the first heaven. The second heaven is the, 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 the entire ecosystem, the, 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 the heavenly bodies, all the gravitational forces up there, the nine planets, all the galaxies and all that. Everything you see beyond the earth zone, that is the second heaven. And there's a third heaven up there where nobody knows. Nobody knows that place. And yet the Bible says that Elijah was taken up to heaven. That word heaven in the Hebrew was not the third heaven. It was just the sky. Okay? The sky, the heaven. The first heaven. So, Elijah... Is not in heaven. Abraham is not in heaven. And by heaven, I'm talking about God's office. The portion of the heavenlies, the portion of the third heavens where God actually operates as his office. So if Elijah is not there, if Abraham is not there, how do we know? Jesus told us in John chapter 3 verse 13 that nobody has ascended to heaven. Nobody. I am not saying it. Jesus is saying this in John chapter 3, verse 13. He said he's the only one who has come from there. He didn't say that, oh, when I was coming, uh, Abraham was up there with my father. I saw Abraham. Jacob is there. Moses is there. No, 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 no. He said no human being has ascended. John three thirteen. He is the only person who has descended and the only person who will ascend. Nobody has been there. So where is Moses? Where is Abraham? Where is Elijah? Where are they? So Jesus gives us a clue when he was hanging on the cross. He didn't tell the thief who got saved, you will be with me in heaven. He didn't say that. He said, you will be with me in paradise. So we know that paradise is the place where the people who die in the Lord are right now, as I speak to you. That is where they are. They are in paradise. They are not in heaven, as in the place we call heaven. You know, they are not there. They are in a special place, which is in the same zone, the arena of the third heavenly places. Heavenly places, they are somewhere there, but they are not actually in the place where we usually call heaven. <laughs> Glory be to God. Um, if you have any question, uh, I'm waiting for you. Just keep uh, bringing them, them up. So, as I said, uh, I'll be doing a part two of this one next week. Um, but I want to do this right now. I just want to demonstrate, uh, just, just give some few examples of how she she all is, how the Old Testament people perceived she all to be. Okay, she all. So you can write these down. I'll read them shortly. Psalm six verse five. Psalm six verse five. Psalm six verse five. Um. There is not a spiritual life in Sheol, for in death there is no remembrance of God. In Sheol, who will give you praise? So the psalmist is speaking about a place called Sheol, where over there, when you get there, there is 
nothing for you. There's nothing like praises and all that. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. It's just, <laughs> just a waiting place. That's all. So Psalm 6 verse 5. You, you also want to write down Psalm 49 verse 15. Psalm 49 verse 15. Yes, Psalm 6 verse 5, Psalm 49 verse 15. God ransomed people from Sheol, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Okay, so Psalm 49 verse 15 is even a confirmation. Okay, <laughs> it's even a confirmation that the old testament people believed that when you enter into hell you can be a good and uh, sheol sorry you can be a good person and still enter into sheol okay only that you just be there you can't praise god again you can't adore god again you you can't sing praises to god you can't do anything there's no joy there there is no pain there is nothing for for those who are good for those who lived a good life there is no pain and yet there is no joy so it's like Sheol is more like it's like a tasteless place, no pain and yet no joy. So it's like you are just you are you have just become neutral. So you are just hanging there and you don't know what is happening. You are just resting, like you have been dimmed off the world until you are delivered again from there to the presence of the Lord. And that is how he puts it. God ransomed people from Sheol, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Let me say this right now. Hell. Hell. Huh. Which part of us actually goes to hell? Is it our spirits or is it our souls? Okay. Now, the spirit doesn't go to hell. When you die, your spirit goes back to source. You see, the spirit is God's component in you. God breathed himself into us. That is why your soul can be corrupted, but your spirit cannot be corrupted. Your body can be corrupted, your soul can be corrupted, but your spirit cannot be corrupted. Your spirit can be refreshed, it can be revitalized, it can be revived, it can be renewed. But your spirit, you see, the devil is not given the power to touch your spirit. But he can torment your soul. He can torment your body. His jurisdiction Ends. You see, just like God uh, is in three-dimensional Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we are also in body, soul, spirit. The spirit component of us is what God put inside of us. So even the armed robber, even the murderer, even uh, Adolf Hitler, all, all the, the so-called people we saw as bad people in the earth, they all had a portion of God inside of them. And it is the spirit which instigates the good part of people, which brings out the good part of people, no matter how bad they are. No matter how bad they are. That is the spirit of God that he breathes into us, which becomes our spirits, which checks us up throughout life. So, any time the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he is able to function on you. You are a prophet. You are a man of God. You are a woman of God. The Holy Spirit, the reason why the Holy Spirit is able to function on you is because when he comes on you, he identifies something similar to himself inside of you. So he connects with your spirit. He doesn't connect with your soul. The Holy Spirit connects with your spirit. So he comes to partner with you and you are spirit. You live in a body and you have a soul. 
Sister Selina, uh, bless you for joining us. Oh, lawyer, lawyer Kusiaka. Wow. Brother, brother, welcome. Bless you for joining in. So, the Holy Spirit connects with our spirits. So, he operates through our spirits into our souls and into our bodies. That is how it works. So, when you die, your spirit goes back to the source, to the one who gave it to you. So whether you are an armed robber, you are a bishop, you are, when you die, your spirit goes to the one who gave it to you. So Jesus would say that, do not fear the one who can destroy the body, but the one who can destroy the body and the soul in hell. Everywhere hell in men is mentioned, it is the soul that goes to hell, not the spirit, not the body. The body goes to the grave. There's an interesting word for the grave in the Hebrew, uh, which we will deal with, uh, God willing, next week. Okay? Uh, glory be to Jesus. Now, um, let's go on with this uh, as I conclude uh, very shortly. Um, let's look at Genesis chapter 37, verse 35. This is Jacob. Jacob. Jacob speaking about Sheol. You know, after being told that his beloved son Joseph had died, uh, you know, he mourned and he was crying out. Oh, no, no, no. I shall go down to Sheol to my son. Oh, you know, so as I have told you earlier, <laughs> even Jacob, and this is Jacob. I mean, this is Jacob, the guy whose name was changed to Israel. Even he did not know about hell. All he knew was, was Asamando. He knew Sheol. He didn't know hell. So, you know, Joseph dies and then uh, his beloved son dies and then he's mourning and crying out, you know, uh, you know, I'll go down to Sheol to my son mourning, you know, a certain beloved son of his. So these are some of the things which actually authenticate the understanding, the fact that the people of old had a different understanding of hell. Okay. Job 14, 13. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath be passed. Second Samuel 22, 5 to 6. So Job 14, 13. Job 14, 13. 2 Samuel 22, 5-6. 2 Samuel 22, 5-6. You want to write down Proverbs chapter 1, verse 12. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 12. You want to write down Isaiah chapter 5, verse 14. Isaiah 5, 14. And you want to write it down, Isaiah 7, verse 11. Isaiah 7, verse 11. Yeah. Okay. I think you have that now. Okay, so... Yeah, let me conclude right now. Uh, I'll continue on this next week. Uh, this is the first time I've done around one hour. I've been thinking that perhaps I've been doing too much. <laughs> so uh, I said to myself today, um, let me pause early. Let me pause early. Let me pause early so that, you know, we will, I, I will be able to ha have the, the little sink in so that we delve in into the next phase, God willing, next week. But before I end, I would like to make these things uh, clear. I have said the first one, two doctrines. The first doctrine is the fact that God loves you so much that there is no way he will make you go to hell. He loves you so much he cannot take you to hell. That doctrine that saying 
is a well calculated doctrine from the pits of hell. It comes from Lucifer himself. It comes from Lucifer himself. God loves us. That is true. But he also punishes us when we misbehave. And he has a breaking point, a point where he cannot tolerate the disobedience of man anymore. He also has a deadline. He also has a deadline. As to when he will say enough is enough. And as I have told you, tens and tens of times in the New Testament, it is written. It is there word for word. We only read Luke chapter 16 because that is the best scenario I wanted to demonstrate things with. But Jesus mentioned hell several times. And I have counted about 34, as I told you earlier, though they are more than a hundred times in the New Testament alone. Now, so that doctrine is not from the Lord. It is against the teachings of the apostles. It is against Christology. It is against God's word. Heaven exists and it exists for the punishment of disobedient children and also those who have rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, let's conclude uh, as I read uh, 1 Peter 3, 18 to 20. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. So, uh, you want to write it down, First Peter 3, 18 to 20. First Peter 3, 18 to 20. First Peter 3, 18 to 20. Then the last one, First Peter chapter 4, verse 6. This is our last Bible uh, reading, First Peter chapter 4, verse 6. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. Now dead. So that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body. But live according to God in regard to the spirit. So, Peter's letter makes us very unequivocal, so explicit, that Jesus indeed descended into hell. I, I've told you about one doctrine which is not of the Lord. It's not a doctrine coming from the Lord. It's not a doctrine from Jesus Christ. It is a doctrine from the devil. I am giving you the next doctrine which is also not of the Lord. And then we are done for tonight. You might have heard some people say that, oh, we have a second chance when we die. So there are people who even pray for the dead and say that, oh, they are dead, but Father, grant them a second chance. Some people call it purgatory, which is a place where if you were on earth and you didn't behave well and you die, you know, perhaps there's a second chance for you there where you can repent. Now, they use First Peter chapter 4, verse 6, which we have just read as their reference. Let me say this categorically, that that doctrine is not what Jesus taught. That is not what Jesus taught us. That is not what the apostles taught. That is anti-biblical. That is anti-Christ. <laughs> it is appointed unto man to die once and after death judgment. Let me, let me tell you where this doctrine came from. Another clever strategy from the stalls of the evil one. 
if we are able to convince people that even if they reject Christ now, you know, as we live on earth right now, let's assume, let's assume, though it's not true, I, I am 200% sure of heaven and 200% sure that there is hell, okay? But let's assume that I am not sure. I don't know. I'm not too sure. Let's assume that the unbeliever is not too sure. Both the believer and unbeliever, whether we are wrong or not, which we are not, we cannot be wrong. It is after we die that we, can, we get to see that, oh, I should have listened to these Christians when they were preaching. It is after we die that we actually realize the fullness of the things we were saying and the things we were preaching and the things the Bible was telling us. It is after we have died, it is after we get to the other side, that we would see the full 100% picture of everything that, oh, okay, when you die, this is how it is. Okay, so this is how it is. This is how the other side is. Okay. So we all will get to see the full picture after death. Okay. That doctrine comes from this. That, oh, because we cannot see the full picture while we are living, after we die and we see the full picture, God will now consider us and say that, oh, before because he's a merciful God, he will say that, oh, uh, these people did not see the full picture while they were living on earth. So let's give them a second chance. And so when you die, there's a second chance. This is a clever way the devil is trying to tell everybody on earth that, hey, you can fool around. You can misbehave. You can, you can do all the bad stuff. You can, you can, you can, you can reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. After you die, there's a second chance. When you die and you get to see the clear picture, you can now uh, avail yourself. Because when you die, First Peter 4, 6, Jesus descended into hell. And once he did it, his spirit is still there. So when you get there into, into hell, he will still come and come and preach for you to repent. So you have a second chance. This is another doctrine from the pit of hell. Exactly, Lawyer Dixon. It is meant to lull you into a false sense of security. Campaign for election. <laughs> yeah, Joe, Joe, Joe. Another life from the pit of hell. Joe, I see your writing. It is a life from the pit of hell. Just to make people misbehave. Look, all the prayers we say for the dead are just formalities. Just to make <laughs> the relatives of the deceased feel comforted and okay all the prayers we say on the dead god have mercy on this poor soul they are purely nonsensical prayers it doesn't end anywhere your chance is while you are alive when you die there is nothing for you there is no repentance after death there is no repentance after death when you die that is it you are done you are done there is nothing there is no coming back nothing and Jesus told us, this is not my doctrine, Jesus told us this in Luke chapter 16. There is no coming back. And there is no second chance. No. Jesus came from the heaven unto the earth once. He died once. He won't come and die again. He came down once. The next time he comes, he's coming as a judge. He died once. He resurrected once. He went into hell once. <laughs> Everything he did, he did it once. So he went to preach to the dead in hell once. It was a one-time thing. It is not a perpetual thing. So let nobody lie to anyone that Jesus' spirit is still hovering over there somewhere um, uh, in hell, and so just as he went there to preach to the dead, he will still go there again and preach to people. No, it is done. It is done. It is done. Hmm. So, <laughs> you, you should get this. 
that everything has been planned before the beginning of time. Everything has been programmed. Yes, Sister Naokoa, I mean, these prayers, you know, yeah, these prayers, by God's grace, I mean, <laughs> we are clergy. These prayers, they are just a way of comforting, but actually praying and hoping that even if the person was bad on earth, after they die, God will have mercy on them. It's purely nonsensical. It is nonsensical prayer. It is an anathema. <laughs> People, it is unheard of in scripture. It is a man-made doctrine. There is, there is no second chance. That's it. You are done. Now, the reason why Jesus descended, you know, into hell was because right from Genesis chapter 1 until the cross, from Adam to the cross, all the people who had died, all of them, did not have the opportunity that you and I have today. They didn't hear Jesus preach. Now, Jesus Christ is the Marking's King. And because God is a just God, God is a fair God, he wouldn't want to set questions, the same questions for people who are in Accra, using, attending Morning Star and Soul Clinic and have all the facilities, write the same IT exam with a person from Brodidu who hasn't even seen a mouse before. God is not Ghana Education Service. So, he wouldn't want to set unfair questions and judge unfair judgments. So Jesus had to make it up for all those who did not hear him preach, all those who did not hear his teaching, even though all the prophets, Moses, Elijah, had warned them, had warned them, had warned them. Jesus still wanted to fulfill all righteousness and still give them another chance. Welcome, uh, brother Wisdom. Welcome. Hey, Perez, data mining. Welcome, brother. Welcome, brother. Brother Daniel, I see you there. Bless you. We are almost done. So Jesus wanted to fulfill all righteousness. So he had to go into hell and preach to all those who had died not in the Lord. From Adam all the way to Calvary, the millions of people, the billions of people, he had to go and make sure we were all going to be judged by the same marking scheme. So he took the syllabus to them, the same syllabus we have now. He took it to them and he preached to them. So he did it once. And that is it. He did it for them. But after he resurrected, everybody who is living, everybody who is alive, from that Sunday morning that Jesus resurrected up to today, tomorrow, whatever, when you die, you are dead. Jesus is not coming to preach to you in hell anymore. When you are in hell, you are only waiting to be crucified in the hellfire. You are just you are just waiting. There is no second chance for you at all. So that is what happened, just to fulfill all righteousness. Okay? So from Jesus' time till now, if you die, and you reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's it. And bear in mind, I have told you already, every sin is sin. But sin is in great. We have iniquities, we have transgressions, we have abominable sins, and we have sins that God hates. Okay? Every sin is sin, all right. But of course, they are in ranks. The worst sin, the worst sin, it's not homosexuality. The worst sin is not armed robbery. The worst sin is not murder. The worst sin, the greatest sin in the world is to reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is the worst sin. 
So Jesus told them when he sent them out, Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 9, when he was sending the disciples out, he told them, look, when you get to a house and they reject you, <laughs> if they reject you, they have rejected me. And when you get out of the house, the dust beneath your feet, just pray the dust on that house. And the punishment that I, Jesus, have reserved for Sodom and Gomorrah, the punishment of these people who have rejected me, who have rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, will be worse than even the punishment of Sodom and Gomorrah. So let nobody tell you that every sin is equal. No. Every sin is sin, but not all sins are equal. <laughs> we have them in great. Certain sins God considers as grievous. And that is why God didn't come down on, on the Amalekites or came down on the Jebusites or anybody. But he came down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because their sin had reached a state of extreme grievousness. <laughs> so we have grievous things. We have worse things. Sins are in, are in dimensions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anum. So Mr. Anum is asking a question here. Uh, please, those Jesus preached to in hell, those who died before his coming, uh -huh, yeah, if they repented and decided to accept Jesus, will their sins be forgiven and given the chance to go to heaven? Yes. Yes. Everybody who accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior when Jesus went to preach in hell, when they accepted, immediately they accepted. They cross over from Hades or hell to paradise. Because the, the, the thief on the cross, his story is not different. They are all in the same category. Okay. Once you believe and accept. So those who rejected in hell, they are still there awaiting hellfire. But those who believed, they cross over to paradise. Yeah. Not to heaven. To paradise. Yeah, paradise is, is a portion of the heavenlies, but technically it is not heaven, but it's it's a portion of the heavenlies. Yes. So that's it. So thank you for that question. I, I want to end here. I want to end here. Um, if there's any other question, if there's any other question. So yeah, please, please, please beware of these doctrines. Beware of these doctrines and and be careful of them and don't treat them lightly. You see, when, when people come to you with flyers telling you God loves you so much, he cannot take you to hell. How can God who loves you so much take you to hell? God loves you so much, he can never take you to hell. He's a loving father. Tell the person, hey, Pao, I mean, you see, when somebody is coming to lure you into hell, if it was legally allowed, and if it wasn't sin, I would have told you to just uh, go get a gun and just shoot the person. By that I mean making it to the presence of the Lord, making it to paradise, or making it straight to heaven if you are raptured. I mean, nothing, nothing should stop that dream. Nothing, no, nobody. Jesus said, if your right hand is disturbing you, cut it off. If your left is disturbing you, cut it off. Better to cut them off than for your whole body to enter into hell. Okay. Uh, 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 Sister Mary Hansen is here. Um, oh, is it the wife of Osofo Hansen? I believe so. Uh, I should think so. Bless you for joining us. Uh, I suspect so. I'm not too sure. Yeah, so thank you so much. I'm not seeing any question over here. And so we are going to stop right here. We'll stop right here. Say a short prayer for yourself. We'll continue this next week, uh, Sunday evening, God willing, at 7 p.m. Uh, GMT. So I want to say a short prayer right now. I want to pray and thank God for tonight. You want to pray just one prayer for your family. You want to pray for every member of your family whom you know is not saved. You know very well if this guy dies today, if he dies tomorrow, he is not making it to paradise. He is making it to hell. 
It could be your family member. It could be your friend. It could be even a church member who is pretending to be a Christian. You want to mention them before the Lord right now and ask the Lord to be merciful upon them and snatch them from the hands of the devil. In the name of Jesus, you want to open your mouth and pray right now. Libra and Taka Pala, Bra and Taya, Labra and Tasta Laba and Daya, Libra and Daya, Labra and Taya Labahanda, Labra Baba. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes, um, let me end in the next two minutes. I, I, I have a question. Uh, lawyer Elsie is asking us, uh, can you please share your thoughts on Matthew chapter 27, verse uh, 51 uh, to 53? So I'm reading that right now. At that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rock split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Yes, so that is a mass resurrection. You see, when Jesus died, he went to preach to millions, if not billions of people. Okay. Now, the people who resurrected were selected by Jesus Christ. Because this is the account of um, Matthew. Now, they were selected because they were people who could be recognized by the, by the people living then. So it isn't everybody that Jesus went to preach to in hell resurrected. There would have been, <laughs> there would have been millions, uh, thousands, if not millions of people resurrected. No, 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 no. Jesus preached to them and they crossed over. However, it was important that Jesus made an experiment. Because while he was ministering on earth, he resurrected people. He resurrected Lazarus. He resurrected uh, Tabitha and many other people. So the disciples and the people had seen the resurrection of people, individuals. So Jesus would tell Mary 
that I am the resurrection of, and the life. When Mary Magdalene said, oh, we know you come and resurrect Lazarus in the last day. And Jesus said, yeah, I am the one who will do that job on the last day. I will resurrect people on the last day, but I don't need to wait for the last day because I am here. I, the one who will do that job in the last day, I'm already here, so there's no need to wait. I'm coming to resurrect Lazarus, okay? So the people never had a physical evidence, something they can carry along, of the mass resurrection that is going to happen on the day of rapture. They didn't have that. They just had uh, an evidence, a sign that it was possible through the prophet Ezekiel, because he commanded dry bones to come up. But that is only a prophetic instance they had heard of. So Jesus demonstrated individual resurrection in his ministry. So he had to demonstrate a mass resurrection to prove to them that indeed all the people who had died will one day resurrect. They will one day resurrect from their resting place in paradise. So it was an experiment. Now Jesus selected the people who resurrected. He didn't just select anybody. He select people who could be recognized in the community. So he, he deliberately select. So like you are living, uh, let's say you are in Accra, you are in, you are in Dansuman, and then some people died there two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. People that you can recognize that, ah, I went to this guy's funeral. I read the tribute at his funeral. I was there. I saw him die. Jesus selected people like that. People who had died recently. Not people who had died many years ago where nobody could recognize. So that when they resurrect, they can form a part of the army. The evangelistic army who would go out to preach that indeed there is the power of the resurrection. It was also to further reinforce the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to counter the anti-resurrection theories. So the twin theory, which says that Jesus was a twin and when he died, the other twin came to replace him. Then we have the stolen body theory, which says that people came to steal his body, blah, 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 you know. And we had the half-dead theory, which says that Jesus did not really die. He was just hanging on the cross and he just collapsed. So later they went to oil his body and, uh, you know, a special doctor through Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich man, got a very expensive doctor who worked on him and he came back to life. So he didn't really die. Those are what we call the anti-resurrection theories. So Jesus had to do that to further enforce his position and make sure that his resurrection was undisputed. And he wasn't the only person who resurrected, but the fact that he also resurrected with an army. He resurrected with an army. So that the army will be part of the whole resurrection evangelism ministry to prove that indeed, when we die, we are only sleeping. We are going to rise again. So he showed us a sign and, and evidence, direct evidence. So people recognize them. So the whole community knew that something had happened. People they had buried. People saw their relatives coming back to life. You'll be in the house and your brother, your sister will come. Hey! Kona, what's are you? Hey! So it was, it was a mighty event. It was a mighty event throughout the whole of Israel. That is why no matter how the Roman authority suppressed the truth, it was impossible. If Jesus had resurrected alone and did not add to it the evidence of other people resurrecting, the Roman authorities could have tried harder to enforce their demonic thoughts on the world. But it wasn't possible because the evidence was just overwhelming. It was impossible. So that was the purpose of the army that was raised from the dead. So it wasn't everybody and it didn't have to be everybody. Just a few people to be recognized by the people in the community. And not just everybody who had died, but the people who had died in the Lord. A select among the people who had died in the Lord. They were the people who were selected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, 
they could have included that i'm not too sure but it only makes sense that it could have also included even people who had died but didn't die in the lord but accepted jesus while he preached in hell you know just to come and show that yes i was a bad boy when i was alive but jesus came to preach to me in hell and here i am i'm an evidence of the works of the son of the living god yeah Okay, uh, oh, Sister Evelyn Saki, wow. Oh, my Evelyn, we haven't spoken in a long while. My Evelyn, I will WhatsApp you. Oh, Sarah, I do mention, oh, bless you for joining us. Angie, 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 let me, Angie, let's talk, let's talk right after here. Angie, let me WhatsApp you right after here. Uh, Sister Patricia, bless you for joining in. God bless all of you. Lawyer Aka, you are all still here. Uh, I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for your time. I don't take it for granted at all. Your data, your time, your your dedication to listen to the truth of God's word. I don't take that for granted at all. Uh, so God bless you so much. Please make a date with me next week. Um, today, this morning, and any other Sunday morning, we have Bible studies. Those of you in Ghana, we start at 4.30 a.m. Oh, my lecturer is here. My, my my lecturer is here. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Bansa, <laughs> bless you for joining us. Wow. Wow, it's a pleasure to see you here. We bless God. We bless God. We had a Bible study this morning. I mean, uh, from 4.30 a.m. And we started today. This is the first time Olive Garden is doing Bible studies via Zoom. We started today. And we had an amazing time. I mean, just John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. We spent one and a half hours. Only on John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. You know, it was it was deep. So you may want to join us next week, Sunday morning, 4.30 a.m. Ghana time. 4.30 a.m. Ghana time. Every Sunday morning, 4.30 a.m. Ghana time for Bible studies, okay? We are delving into the gospel of John on Sunday morning, 4.30 a.m. So the flyer will be on my uh, Facebook profile. Once again, I thank you all. I thank you all. Let me bless you with the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his shalom now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Bless you. Bless you. See you next week. Same time. Bless you. Oh, Mr. Bansa, bless you all. Captain Yan, have a good night. Have a good evening. Bless everyone. See you next week, same time as we do part two of hell. Hell, part two. God bless you.